ಚರಮಾಣ ಯವಲ್ಲೋಕಯತೆ In the 7th century AD, a young Buddhist monk, Xuanza, embarked on an epic journey to the Brahmanic country, the birthplace of Buddhism, India. His mission was to seek clarity on the metaphysical concepts in Buddhism and to bring the true law, the Dharma, to the people of China. He traveled on the well-established trade road, the Silk Road. In China, Buddhism was established in the 1st century AD when the two Indian monks, Kashyap Matang and Dharmaraksha, reached Luyan in the royal court of Emperor Ming Di of Han Dynasty. Kashyap translated the Sutra of 42 chapters, which is the first translation of Buddhist text in Mandarin. The early translations were literal translations. The 4th century monk Kumarjiva of Kusha is credited for the translation of many Buddhist texts in lucid style, emphasizing on the meaning and concepts. Kumarjiva, son of Kumarayan, the nobleman turned monk from Kashmir, and Jivika, the princess of Kusha. Shwanza had studied the work of Kumarjiva and was impressed. He found many schools of Buddhism were operating in China and there was inconsistency in the concepts and interpretation. Shwanza decided to seek clarity and learn the true nature of law, the Dharma. Kumar Jeeva is a revered figure in Chinese Buddhist culture. Even his white horse, who carried the Buddhist text for Kumar Jeeva, is honored by a pagoda in Dun Han. The route chosen by Shwanza to reach India was well established but still dangerous Silk Road. The entire route from Chagan to Macedonian Empire was opened and secured by Zian Ken in 2nd BC for Han Dynasty Emperor Wu. He brought under control or negotiated peace with the interlying states, cities and nomadic communities on the trade route. Fortified outposts and watchtowers were built and of course the famous wall of China closing the strategic passes in Henji corridor. The wall closes the gap between Kilian mountains and the rolling He mountains in the Gobi Desert. This is the beginning of fall of China in Gobi Desert. Today in the restored fort of Jiayuan 
The statue of Henshan stands imposing the authority on the gate. There were beacon towers to keep a watch over the Silk Road strategic locations. Kesel Khaga Beacon Tower is one of them. Smoke and fire signals were transmitted from one tower to the next one. It was a relatively fast warning system. In his journey, Schwanza visited many monasteries and Buddhist temples. The Bingling Temple is one of them. The Lishuai Dam Reservoir has submerged the old road to Bingling. The Bingling range is of sedimentary rocks, not good for sculptures. The 27-meter tall Maitreya Buddha statue is from Tang dynasty. The present statue is a restored one. The caves date back from 3rd century AD.
the seven storied matisi or the horse hoof temple is from 3rd century the period of eastern din dynasty this temple and monastery is operational and monks live here The basically caves in the Motu Valley of Flaming Mountains were known for rich temples and the beautiful murals. The murals bore influence of Chinese and Iranian style while having small influence of Indian style. The caves were vandalized by the wave of Islam sweeping this region in the 14th century. The German explorer Albert von Leeuwenhoek explored these caves in 1913 and removed some of the murals to Berlin. Mogao caves near Dunhan are dated from 4th century and are spread over a large distance. A few of them are accessible for general public. Apart from its famed murals, of which a few survive, the caves are known for its collection of manuscripts in different languages. It is believed that after the fall of Kingdom of Hotan to the Khanakhanid invaders in 1006, the monks in Magao and surrounding area collected manuscripts, scrolls, and over 15,000 paper books. place them in a cave now known as a library cave and sealed the cave 
On 25th June 1900, the Abbot Wong Yunul discovered the library cave. In early 1900, many explorers, including Aurel Stein and Paul Pillow, removed many manuscripts and pictures from the treasure. In 1956, the first premier of China, Chow Wen Lai, took personal interest in the Magao case and its library. This saved it from the vandalism in the Cultural Revolution. Not all the Buddhist caves, monasteries, temples and religious places were lucky enough to escape the vandalism in Cultural Revolution. In today's sanitized cultural scene of China, it is termed as human conflicts. The giant Buddha temple in Shanghai suffered extensive damage. The temple dedicated to Buddha in Nirvana was previously also known as Hall of Supreme Awakening. The 11th century temple from Western Ji dynasty period has a 35 meter long Buddha statue of clay in Nirvana. The temple library was hidden behind a double wall. This was known to a nun, Bain Ju Yao, who guarded the secret. This saved the manuscripts from the vandalism of cultural revolution. A statue of nun Bain Ju Yao is erected in the temple premises to recognize and honor the brave nun. Xuan Zha probably visited the crescent moon oasis and the monastery near it. Today, it is a place for tourists seeking the magic of sands, dunes and camel rides. The history tells us that the oasis has never dried up nor changed its size. The building near it with classical architectural appearance is in fact quite modern. It has viewing galleries and curio shops. Like the winds reshaping the sand dunes, the real wind of time has changed the world of Xuanzha beyond recognition. Today, on the Silk Road, the caravans of trucks have replaced the camel caravans.
to get an idea of the silk road on which Schwanzahn traveled, we have to ignore the smooth wide highways, the power and railway lines and the wind power farms and look at the countryside. Looking at the harsh terrain, one wonders how come those prosperous cities described by Schwanzahn and other Silk Road travelers could ever exist. The two branches of Silk Road, the northern and the southern one, are on the rim of the Tarim Basin, which forms the major portion of the Silk Road through harsh terrain. The Tarim Basin is encircled by snow-clad Tian Shan and Kunlun mountain ranges. The ice and snow melt from the Tian Shan and Kunlun mountains flow down forming rivulets which vanish into the great Takla Makan desert. But before that it leads to formation of some oasis and raising the groundwater table. The raised groundwater table on the mountain slopes led to the adoption of Kare's irrigation system. The courage system used the general terrain layout and the geological features to its advantage. It consisted of well shafts and underground tunnels or channels. The well shafts were used to remove the material dug out from the water channels. The tunnel caused redirection of the natural underground water flows. The system was widely in use. Yar city 
from the second century BC lies on the Yarnas River island. It is a large island of about 700 hectares formed by changes in the river course. The river has cut a 30 meter high terrace with vertical earthen sides on the perimeter which serve the function of a protective city wall. The city was well planned with residential district, warehousing and administration district, temple and tomb district and a large courtyard for ceremonies. The city was prosperous till 13th century. The city built in early times is actually carved out rather than built. That is why you find many residential places subterranean and streets with no door entrances and windows. Only in the later era, the city had buildings constructed with adobe and rammed earth building techniques. The temple district is an example of it. The Subhash ancient city is spread over on the both banks of Kucha river. It is from the V and Jin dynasty period from 3rd to 5th century. Meaning of Subhash is headwater of rivers. The city ruins are in bad shape. In fact, on the city site, cultivation used to take place before it was declared as a protected monument. The size of the remaining ruins of the Buddhist pagoda tell us the grand scale of the project. The city of Gochan lies just on the northeastern rim of the great Taklamakan desert. It was a major halt on the Silk Road. The city was established in the first century BC, about the time when the Silk Road trade came into existence. The city was destroyed in the 14th century, around the time when the importance of Silk Road was dwindling. In the recent past, peasants in this area actually removed the earth from the city walls as construction material and started cultivation on the ruins. Xuanzhan stayed in the city for more than six months. The then ruler, Ku Wantai, was so impressed with the lectures of Xuanzhan that he insisted that Xuanzang to abandon his plan to travel to India and stay with him as a royal preacher. Xuanzang declined the offer, but the king would not allow him to leave. Xuanza went on a hunger strike. Ultimately, Wantai relented and granted permission. He even provided supplies attendants and guides and most importantly letters of introduction and request for assistance from the rulers of Sogdia and Turkic states up to Samarkand and even to the king of Kashmir. The king even accompanied 
Schwanza to see him off up to the flaming mountain. One gets an idea of the life in the old cities from the burial tombs and articles found in them. Some of the items are displayed in museums. The burial ground of V and Jean ancient tomb has about 70,000 graves. Few of the tombs are open. They usually have three chambers. The innermost chamber contains the body. The outer chambers usually have painted tiles and bricks. The painted bricks are about 15 to 1700 years old. Usually, the paintings are about the life in general of the deceased person. The skeletal remains and the mummified bodies tell about the diverse descendants including Caucasian ancestry. In the Turpan Museum, the almost complete skeletons of dinosaurs share the space with the other cultural artifacts. The glory of the Buddhist cities on the Silk Road faded in the face of Islamic wave. The destruction of the cities was appalling. The Karakhani writer Mahmud al Kashagiri from the 11th century describes it as We came down on them like flood. We went out among their cities. We tore down the idol temples. We shat on the Buddha head. The following Islamic architecture in the cities lack the scale and grandeur of Samarkand and Bukhara buildings, which are emulated here.
the modernization in the recent past has changed the face of the cities on Silk Road. The transformation is stunning. In the old times, the greenery was restricted to the oasis. Today, with the modern irrigation systems, the government has transformed a part of the globy desert. The character of the YC cities as transit points on Silk Road is totally lost for the cities like Hotan and Kashgar. After starting from Jakarta, the modern Rishian city, Shwanzand reached Samarkand after about an year and a half. He would not have seen the beautiful Registan Square as it came up much later. Shwanza would have seen the prosperous, vibrant city of Makarand, which today lies in ruins. He would have met merchants and monks of various origins and learned from them of different countries. Shwanzahand reached Kashmir after visiting Bamiyan and Purushpura, that is the modern Peshawar. In Bamiyan, Shwanzah would have seen the Buddha statues in full glory, golden yellow adoring jewels. The statues were completed just one century previously. In Peshawar, he visited the Kanishk Stupa. Shwanzan visited Sarnath and Bodh Gaya and then reached Nalanda. He had already spent two years on the road. He studied in Nalanda and acquired mastery over Buddhist texts and scriptures. He perfected his Sanskrit, which he has studied in China.
Chuanza studied the different schools of Buddhist philosophy, mastered the different meditation techniques. He was acknowledged as outstanding master of Mahayana Buddhism. Shwanza has acquired what he was seeking. After collecting more than 600 Buddhist texts, he was ready to return home, his mission being successful. In his quest for knowledge, Shwanzan traveled in India and almost covered all the places of Buddhist learning in the East, West, North and South of India. Shwanza wrote extensively about the places he visited and what he observed in a book, Journey to the Western Regions. This book was written for the Tang Dynasty Emperor Tai Sung to plan his trade and defense strategies. The book described in details the cities on the Silk Road, their economy, their defense systems, the infrastructure and the culture and the inventions. It covered the Turkic, Sogdian, Karakhanid and Gandhar states and of course India. He wrote about Sarnath, Nalanda and Bodh Gaya, giving the plan of the places and the dimensions. In fact, the book became a source book for Cunningham who carried out the excavations at Sarnath, Nalanda and Bodh Gaya to reveal the ruins of the past. Shwanza reached back to Jian after 18 years with a second mission of translating the 600-odd Buddhist scriptures which will last for his lifetime.